tracks through info like um informative events uh with the guest speakers people who have uh, dedicated their lives and um, in, and are knowledgeable when it comes to the cause and, and to the history of Palestine. And inshallah, we can bring those to you very soon. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu. We got a lot. We got a good amount of people. Mashallah, sick. Um, I'll just give you guys some time to sign up, and then we can uh, carry on. Um, and feel free to ask any questions. Oh, hi, Sayyid. Salam, how are you doing? Yeah, long time, long time. Right? Yeah, well, alaykum as -salam. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk, but yeah, I thought I'd try to, like, maybe get everyone to interact, if I can. Yeah. For, for, yeah. for the time being, so that uh, the session can go smoothly, um, the admins has tried to mute everyone. But feel, so, free, uh, feel free to use the, uh, the comment section to ask any questions or have a conversation. There's no problem with that. Just so that we can keep things as organized as possible. Well, it's good to hear your voice, bro. Um, and feel free to ask any questions, uh, anything, any, um, just feel free to ask questions in the box. Um, the whole point is to uh, to be as, uh, for this event to be as educational, as much as uh, interactive and fun as well as possible. There is uh, um, no harm in that, of course. Just check the chat. Is that everyone at the moment? We'll just give it a bit of time, we'll give it a couple of minutes before we start. It's really awkward. I just hate this camera so much. Let's try and no, it doesn't work. So weird. Like this this laptop's not mine. Well, the camera's on the keyboard rather than on the top. Oh well. It's Dell, so. Don't get there. Oh, um, I'm from. Uh, oh, okay. I, I should have maybe said that in my introduction. So, um, I'm from uh, Hebron, Al Khalil, in Arabic, uh, in the West Bank. That's where my family's from. Um, a lot of Tamimis are originally from there in Palestine. Um, and there are there are uh, a good amount of Tamimis in, in Nablus, yeah, that's true. Uh, Tamimi clan is very big. Um, they're not just in, in the West Bank. They extend to even outside Palestine. Um, they extend to Jordan, uh, Iraq, the Gulf, different places really. So, yeah. Uh, can, I just, can I just ask that everyone um, tries to um, put in their like first name and second name so it's just easier for us to identify everyone, please? Um, so that when when there's a winner, we can uh, identify them, and and all the other runner-ups, you all winners. Don't worry. But just, yeah. Let me just see who's joined. Amr, are we ready? Like them ones, that I feel bad about checking my phone. But all right, we'll wait for another a couple more minutes um, before we carry on. If anyone has any questions, anything really, just ask. Really, whether it's something uh, some information about this event, about ASAP, or just general Palestine questions, whatever it is, just really ask. Like, don't hesitate while we wait. Yeah, I hope uh, hope everyone's keeping safe. When was ASAP founded? <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, I don't remember the date. I don't remember when. But um, our first, our initial meetings actually happened a long time ago. We're talking maybe um, not the summer that passed, the summer before. Um, so summer, somewhere, somewhere around 2019. But it it took uh, it took time. Um, so the founders, it's a group of people. Uh, it's a group of people. Sorry. Um, and uh, it, we we were a couple students um, who were active in the uh, in the Palestine activism student scene, and uh, we got together and we uh, founded ASAP. So, a couple, so a group of people. What is the purpose of ASAP, and what is the long term vision? The purpose of ASAP is to cater for 
um, student activists uh, who are working uh, in the in the Palestinian cause, um, irrespective obviously of of their background and whatnot, as long as you're you know uh, a student and you uh, want to advocate for Palestine, uh, we're here to help in any way possible. Kato, we we would like to try and uh, connect you guys through networking sessions. We'd like to uh, organize informative events. We'd like to connect you to speakers and resources, anything you guys really need. We, we want to try and work together along with other organizations that are very, uh, like, for example, FOA. Um, and I think there's a lot of other organizations that are working on the scene that we want to um, actively bring as well so they can help. Um, Long-term vision of ASAP um, goes hand in hand with the purpose where we're trying to establish a network uh, for students, for them to feel confident, for them to feel supported. Um, it's very difficult, and, I, and it comes from uh, experience that we've had and um, that I've personally had through um, the society at City University. Um, it, it's very difficult to work as a society when there's not much support out there. Um, alhamdulillah, we've managed to connect really well with other universities, uh, UCL, um, Queen Mary, Imperial, uh, King's, um, and other universities around the country. And we've managed to kind of help each other. But sometimes gets really like, if you want to say like a bit lonely when it comes to, to, to being active on the ground. So it's very important for organizations such as ASAP, which, which have come for this purpose to support uh, these groups. Um, so ASAP is currently um, operating in the UK, but again, this is a universal and humanitarian cause. So there isn't harm in, um, in working with other organizations, but I think it's, it's quite early, uh, it's quite early days. So hopefully, inshallah, once we've established something here and once we've managed to, um, you know, uh, bring something to the table, which we're trying to do through these events and so, and so on, um, then we can start working towards, um, you know, joining hand in hand with other organizations in, internationally, whether it's across the pond in America or in Europe, sorry. Um, how can we as individuals get involved with ASAP? Um, and can we help ASAP? Are there on the ground projects currently or planning to? Um, if you're really interested in, uh, in getting involved, just uh, contact uh, myself or, or the admin, or you can even contact the social media accounts. Uh, but you can contact me, uh, say, because you know, anyways, um, and uh, we can uh, we can you know uh, talk about it a bit and see what there is. At the end of the day, the more the merrier when it comes to. Okay. So yeah. Um, oh yeah, I think uh, when it comes to um, societies in the UK, uh, we'd like to cater for them, and we'd also like to. Um, be an umbrella organization for these societies. So ideally, uh, we want to um, form an affiliation uh, uh, kind of like a process so we can get people to affiliate. Oh, people are leaving. Um, uh, Amr, can you just check to see if there's people leaving because being mentioned. Um, yeah, there are people leaving at the moment. We'll just give them a bit more time. Maybe they have to rejoin and then we can carry on. Uh, I don't think they're leaving because it just it connected me as well. So I'm trying to reconnect. Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so we'll just wait a bit more because they need to reconnect. And so on, and then we can uh, carry on. It's fine. It happens. It happens to the best of us. Um, we'll see. So. Um, can I just please ask that if you have just a first name or a second name or abbreviations, can you please put in a name and a last name so that we can identify you? Um, because, um, yeah, so that we can identify you uh, when it comes to the, the end of the session. Um, so there's some people that have just written letters and so on or nicknames. Can I urge you please to change your names to first names and second? Thank you. So first name, second name, please. Yeah, just give me a second because I'm trying to like reconnect by just joining again by saying that my name is taken. So I might just put an abbreviation in brackets with my full name. Right? Someone have a name as you. 
No, it's I don't know. It's just like bugging. I don't know. Okay. Um, try and leave completely and come back. If you can't change your name, try and leave and come back. I think maybe, maybe that would work. And I'm seeing a lot of people leaving, so they're either reconnecting or they're trying to change their name. We'll we'll give it some time, yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind if you have a first letter than a surname, like what I've done, as long as it's easier to identify uh, uh, people. Because if you have just a first name, we we it won't be as easy to get a hold of you. Do you know what I mean? But we'll see. We'll just wait a couple more minutes, see what I want with everyone, you know, and then we'll carry on. Uh, again, just to reiterate, I hope everyone is uh, keeping safe um, and being productive uh, in these times. It's quite difficult. Um, and yeah, just make sure that you guys are constantly, you know, distracting yourself and doing things so that you don't fall into the trap of procrastination because. Uh, I myself have fallen a victim to it, so just trying to give some advice there. Okay, you know, we're trying to wait for maybe like 30, 32. Uh, have you changed your name? Let me see if you've changed your name. Thing is, I can't see the full Kahoot screen, so I don't know. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Mesa, I can't change. I can't see your name, but uh, uh, we're trying to start. Um, I'm going to assume Mesa that your name is uh, fine. Um, so we're on 30 now. We're just trying to ideally wait for 32, but if it doesn't go up, then we'll just we'll carry on, yeah? So just give us two minutes. Hello, uh, we can start if you want. Uh, All right. So I'll, keep it, I'll keep it open, so maybe people, they can join later. Uh, okay. No. Okay? Uh, yeah, but yeah. Can, can you hear the music, the Kahoot? Me, personally? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, I'll fucking up. Okay. I don't hear anything right now. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, now we can hear it. Someone just left, so let's see what that. You guys ready? Uh, I'm... Okay. What is the name of this Palestinian food? First option is Zata. Second option is Mtabbal. The third option is Hummus. And your fourth option is Lebanese. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Okay, I mean, it's kind of sad that you, some people did get it wrong because they want to but um, yeah, it is hummus. Um, that's the right answer. Oh, look, we got people in the lead, mashallah, Mass is uh, leading. Um, just a quick, like, uh, background story. So, hummus. Um, there's a lot of dispute on where it actually originated from, but it's just crushed peas mixed with a couple uh, with a bit of uh, tahini sauce, which is also a sauce that cater, which is sesame um, uh, paste. And yeah, um, you know, in Israel they they uh, they try to claim it for themselves, but come on, we we know better than that. Um, uh, I'm, uh, there are some people that have trouble joining in, so can you just check it out and contact them, please? Um, I think we're ready to move on to the next question.
What is the name of this Palestinian dessert? One, yeah, this one, this one's quite obvious, and I've seen how quick you guys are answering. So. Yeah, I don't even know what Namura is, but yeah, you guys got that right. It's Knafe. Um, interestingly, um, if you look at that, if you look at that diagram, by the way, if you look at that photo, that's Knafe Khishne, or if you want to translate it literally, it's like rough Knafe, and it uses um, a specific type of pastry, and it comes like strands, and then you have to ro uh, toast it and set up with the cheese but if you go to nablus and if you go to places like uh, jordan and, and syria and lebanon um you can actually get knafi na'me which is um which they use semolina for and it's a different type of pastry and it, it's smooth rather than like this um so this is typically what you'd find in, you'd find this in palestine you'd find this in jordan you'd find this um in turkey a lot of the time um but yeah there's just different types of knafi so yeah and you can even have knafi with cheese you can have knafi with ishta, which is cream. So yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, can we just double check Amr uh, with the people that can't join? Oh, okay. Uh, Soy, I guess. I think I, I think it's sorted. Oh. Oh, okay. Wow, these guys are going up. Say no more. Close the door. All right, we good to go. The color of the uh, kufi, yeah, we call it kufi. <laughs> We have white and black, we have blue and black, we have white and red, we have white. Why is it like that? So weird. That's okay. We'll give you an answer. Yeah, it's white and black. If you go to places like Jordan, you tend to see red and white. If you in the Gulf, they tend to wear red and white as well. Um it, it ranges differently across uh, Bedouin tribes and different uh, regions as well. But the most typical you'll see is the white and black. But yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. The Uthmans are going up. Say no more. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, high, it's, a, it's quite a, a tough competition right here. Let's see. What is the name of this Palestinian food? Is this Mdekhan? Is this Makhloube? Is this Shawarma? Or is this Anayi? Okay, yes, yeah, so the majority of you got it right. It's msakhan. And msakhan is uh, pieces of chicken um, served with a, a homemade fresh bread um, with uh, onions, um, uh, roasted, they're roasted. Uh, well, they're boiled usually, almonds. And then there's something done to them. And then uh, a lot of sumac as well. And that's where you get the purple color from. The other one that's very interesting is maklube. Uh, maklube is one of the most famous Palestinian dishes. And it, if you translate it literally, it means upside down. And upside down is, um, what's it called? Uh, literally like rice, uh, vegetables. It depends on the choice of meat. It depends on the choice of uh, chicken. And then it's literally put in a way in an arranged so that when you flip it, the orientation uh, goes goes around, and that's why they call it maklubi and so on. It's a very, very, very nice dish as well. So yeah. Which one is Right, so Jerusalem is the uh, capital of Palestine. Um, uh, it's also a very important city um, for uh, all uh, faiths, uh, all, all of the three faiths. Um, um, it's obviously got a massive, massive dispute right now. Um, obviously, we know recently, um, well, from 2017, when uh, Donald Trump came into power, um, about the uh, the move of the Israeli embassy into um, into Jerusalem, which was a violation, of course, of international law. But not only that, um, it obviously um, uh, was a provocative move and so on. But of course, we all know and we all stand by the fact that Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. And inshallah, one day we'll see Palestine from the river to the sea. 
um, free, inshallah, uh, including Jerusalem. And yeah. Gaza is bordered by which country to the south? Try and visualize the Palestine map if you can. Try and figure out which country you want. Yeah. Yeah. Is it Egypt? Is it Lebanon? Is it Syria? Or is it Saudi Arabia? Yeah, this will be good, right? Um, so yeah, it is Egypt. It's uh, uh, it's quite a quite a, it's quite a significant border. It's Gaza's only o technically open land crossing, but unfortunately, uh, in these days, um, it's not just the um, uh, Israeli government or the Israeli forces that operate a uh, siege against the Palestinians. Unfortunately, the Egyptian uh, government at the moment is also operating um, a lot of... Um, Amr, uh, someone, there is someone that has trouble joining. Um, but yeah, so uh, just back to the point. Um, so yeah, that's just one of the uh, borders, that uh, Gaza borders. The rest is it borders um, Palestine. Wow, it's quite tough. It's very close. It's very close. Which Palestinian city is believed to be the oldest city in the world? Is it Bethlehem? Is it Nablus? Is it Hebron or is it Jericho? I wonder. One time, it? Hey, so Jericho. Now, interesting point. Jericho actually happens to be the lowest point on Earth. Uh, it's uh, below sea level. I don't know exactly how many meters below sea level, but if you notice, look at that. So that's on the Palestinian side, of course. Um, there is a lot of there is monasteries that are built into the uh, mountains. Um, the low, obviously, the lower you go. That uh, no, so it's not lower than the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on Earth, but Jericho surrounds it, and Jericho surrounds the Dead Sea and goes all the way up. And then when it goes all the way up, depending on where you are, um, the center part connects to Jerusalem. Um, other parts connect to Hebron um, and uh, to other areas of the West Bank. But interestingly, it is very uh, historical, and there is a lot of um, religious significance to that area. So yeah, we'll just uh, uh, move on to the next question. Just to share the link. Which of these is not a Palestinian city? Is it Tukan? Is it Zerka? I wonder which one. Okay, okay. Um, it's not. I mean, I don't. I don't know, you guys. Um, Zarqa is in Jordan. It's to the northeast of Amman, the capital city. It's very big. It's like a desert, but small desert. Um, it's got a town, obviously. Um, and it's actually on the way to Syria. So if you are, if you make your way to Syria, or uh, to the north of Jordan, a lot of the time you may end up going through Zarqa. Um, but yeah. Interesting point. When do Palestinians mark the Nakba catastrophe anniversary every year? Is it the 15th of April? Is it the 30th of April? Is it the 15th of May? Or is it the 30th of May? Okay, so most of you got that right. I'm really proud of you guys because, I mean, sometimes it is tough to get, get the exact date. Um, the catastrophe occurred when um, occurred upon the formation of the State of Israel, and this was just off, just literally right after um, the uh, the British uh, colonialist regime or the British mandate uh, falling out of Palestine and and uh, leaving. And what ended up happening is when the soldiers left. Zionist gangs, um, which were already uh, mounting attacks on British soldiers and on Palestinians, um, were able to form bigger militias and t take over old British posts. Um, and they started attacking villages and uh, um, amassing to massacres, such as one of the most famous massacres is the Deir Yassin massacre, where hundreds of Palestinians were killed. Um, and 
hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of, of Palestinian towns were, um, were attacked and many, uh, so a hundred, a couple hundred thousand Palestinian, uh, Palestinians were kicked out of their homes. And that's why we have the Palestinian diaspora and that's why we have a huge uh, refugee, refugee population and it was 15th of May, 1948. Which discriminatory political movement appeared in the 19th century based on establishing a state on land of Palestine? Is it the communist movement? Is it the Nazi movement? Is it Zionism? Or is it the Bolshevik movement? I talk about pronunciation. Hey, you're not most of it right. So it is Zionism. So Zionism is the belief um, that um, there should be a state for the Jews. Um, and on Palestine, initially, actually, um, the idea, idea proposed by uh, Theodor Herzl was actually Theodor Herzl. If you see that little frame on the top, that's Theodor Herzl. He he's considered the father of Zionism or the father of the idea of the birth of the state of Israel. In fact, he didn't have a specific land in mind at the at the time. Um, also, he wasn't a practicing Jew. He was uh, quite secular. However, it was an idea to form a state. Initially, there was a lot of uh, a lot of people favored actually Argentina um, for the state of Israel uh, to establish state of Israel because it had uh, rich agricultural lands. It was very big area. Um, um, it was Argentina is much much more much bigger than Palestine or the land the region that we um, call Palestine. And also, the transfer between Argentina and Palestine happened later, where there was a need to convince uh, a lot of Jews in Europe who weren't really keen about leaving their homes in Europe. Um, and so there became a, a religious tie to the movement where, okay, Palestine um, and Jerusalem are have some significance uh, in Judaism. And therefore, if we link uh, religion to Palestine, therefore we can convince um, uh, um, the Jewish population that weren't really keen on uh, going there. And yes, that's right. So Hamza just... Uh, pointed out that a lot of Jews were told that Palestine was uninhabited and waiting for them. That is very true. And in sessions like these, um, you had notable um, um, members of the House of Lords, um, uh, ministers in the British government who were part of the Zionist uh, uh, movement, who were saying that Palestine was nothing but a malarial swamp. Um, and there's there's videos to, to said. Um, yeah, there was a lot of um, other options that they were they considered the Zionist movement considered, but it's just very interesting to see how it all kind of amounted and then it all ended up going to Palestine. Yeah, we move on. Yeah, our masses on it, you know. Uh, but mashallah, like you're doing really good. But again, the competition is quite quite um, uh, fierce. So it's good to see that everyone's uh, you know interacting among Palestinians. Revolutions against British mandate and Zionist. Uh, which one is the place? There's the Revolution of 1921, the Burak Revolution of 1929, the Genocide of 1936, all of the above. Would you have more? Just test your knowledge. Okay, so yeah, it is uh, all of the above. And I remember, um, obviously, I wasn't there, I wasn't alive, but I remember uh, watching some videos from the archives and uh, reading. There was there's a very very good documentary by the way about this and it's called a Nakba the catastrophe and it's you can visit a website I'll try we can try and share the website on ASAP story soon as well it's called palestineremix.com um, uh, and palestineremix.com is an entire database of films uh, documentaries anything related to Palestine really and this four part uh, uh, documentary on the Nakba actually just starts from before and it talks about these revolutions the general strike happened on all of these revolutions and, and and the strike happened under the british mandate even though the zionist presence was there um, but it was because palestinians were seeing that the british were letting um uh, a, a zionist presence kind of take over um and and the british in themselves were colonial bodies as well and they were oppressing the palestinians at the same time the general strike ended up um leaving a, a scar in, in the uh in, in 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 the Palestinians because the the British ended up um, executing three notable um, uh, uh, leaders. I'm trying to remember the names of them. There's uh, 
this one from Dar Jamjum, so family of Jamjum. Um, uh, there's there's a couple. There three notable names. I actually forgot them, but yeah, it's very interesting. And you can if you check the the documentary, it's very interesting and it gives you this information. Sorry, yeah. I had it. In, I had it. In my head. I don't know. I just forgot. Yeah. We can move on to the next. Uh, um, I thank you, Asia, for helping because it's very important. Like, if anyone uh, does join late, that like, you just join the game with the pin. So thank you so much for helping. All right. Okay, so this round is double points. What is the name of the massacre that took place in a village west of Jerusalem, 9th of April, 1948, and killed about 250? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I'm missing or not. Is that helpful to him? I'm trust with the the way I met. Okay, you say no more. I mean, my mashallah, majority of you guys got it. So yeah, this is the Deir Yassin massacre. Interestingly, the Zionists led these massacres and they, they did these massacres for the sake of scaring other villages. So it was a very, very smart uh, tactic. Um, they would go to a village, they would massacre the people there, and other villages would hear about it. And therefore they'd be like, you know what, let's leave our villages for a couple of days, let's go visit our family somewhere else. And uh, we'd come back in a couple of days. Uh, my grandma had to do that. So my grandma lived in uh, the south of Palestine, in Bir Sheba, Bir Sabia. And when the Deir Yassin massacre happened, her and, and her parents had to go to Hebron, to Khalil, to visit their family, my, uh, my family. And they, they thought that they would take their keys and they wouldn't take much stuff with them. They'd just leave everything in the house because they were going to come back a couple of days later. They never went back because what this uh, tactic did is it scared people to go out of their houses. So when they left the houses, um, the Zionist gangs, um, and by the way, the Zionist gangs ended up forming the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, um, we like to call them the Israeli occupational forces. Well, but anyways, and they would go into these houses and just take them. So when Palestinians were to go back, they would find other people living in their homes. So yeah, now I think we can move on to the next uh, uh, question. I hope I could wake up one day and find no Palestinian child. Who said that? Odomai, David Ben-Gurion, Ayn Wiseman, or Herbert Salim? Eight seconds then. Deep. So, um, Herbert Samuel, uh, sorry, I want to say Herbert Samuel. Golda Meyer um, was the first uh, female Israeli um, prime minister. She was actually, uh, so she was in Palestine during even the British mandate. And she was a, a big icon for the state of Israel and for the Zionist uh, movement, even before the foundation of, of Israel. Uh, there are videos of her where she says that she's in Palestine and she acknowledges the name Palestine. Um, and so the fact that a state or the fact that if you think about this, if you deep this and you reflect upon what someone like this has said, imagine a prime minister saying that they hope that an ethnic group or uh, the in, we're talking about indigenous people here. We're talking about the original um, people in the land. This is a prime minister who's supposed to be um, internationally recognized. It's supposed to be a state. It's supposed to be a free state, a, de a democracy, as uh, um, a lot of uh, Zionists claim, um, says something like this. And yet, no one actually really bats an eye and no one really cares. And this is the unfortunate reality that we live in um, and where the occupation of Palestine is normalized and apartheid is normalized. And yes, you said the leader of the uh, militant group that did this ended up becoming prime minister. Yeah, that's true. Most of the IDF uh, heads, most of the people that led these uh, massacres, most of the people that um, committed war crimes and were active in committing these war crimes ended up being um, heads of state, ministers, carried on. Because at the end of the day, it's a colonial state, it's a colonial entity. When, you're, when, when, when you colonize a country, you commit crimes to even be there. So what's going to stop you from committing crimes later on? And what's going to stop you from excelling? The whole point is that you're excelling through the crimes that you commit. So yeah. Uh, move on to the next question. It's 50 questions, you know, that speak still. The number of Palestinian refugees who were displaced from their cities and villages during the Nakba is estimated at? Less than 400,000 refugees, or is it at least 700,000 refugees? Is it exactly 550,000 refugees, or is it more than 935,000 refugees? Tough one, but we got a lot of questions, so there's always a chance for you guys to kind of get ahead. 
Okay. Wow. Well, I do, most of you got it right. I'm not gonna lie. I was expecting uh, uh, a lot of people to get it wrong, but mashallah, that's really good. Um, I mean, the facts are there. Um, it was a very, very big number, and this is why we have millions of refugee populations diaspora as a result. When the when immigration issue. Was it in November 1917? Was it in December 1917? August 1917? Or was it in September 1917? I guess we can all agree that it was in 1917. Four seconds left. Okay, so yeah. Um, so this is a letter. So this is the letter that Lord... Uh, so that uh, Lord Arthur Balfour um, who, used, who was the uh, the foreign secretary at the time, sent to Lord Rothschild. And it was a promise, a declaration in which he dedicates uh, uh, um, Palestine to the establishment of a state for the Jewish people. Now, let's ask ourselves the question. If, I, if you colonize a country, the country isn't yours. You've occupied it militarily by force. But then you promised that country or that it doesn't have to be a country, it doesn't have to be a state, it just be a piece of land, but there are people that are living there. Um, and you go and promise that land that isn't actually yours to someone else. Then you see where the fault is. You see where the problem is. It's the fact that a colonial entity um, went and promised a land that isn't theirs. A land that isn't empty, a land that isn't barren, a land that was filled with um, fields of um, Orange, orange trees in Yaffa, um, olive trees, uh, uh, vineyards. Um, it had the sea on one side and the river on one side. It has mountains. It, it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of land. Um, so it negates the claims that a lot of people made that it was a just a, a malarial swamp and what so and so ever. And it was filled with um, farmers, um, uh, d different fields. Uh, uh, where they are people that served in, 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 in different disciplines and whatnot, just a, more, a diverse population, as a matter of fact. And someone comes and claims otherwise and says, you know what, this is, this, this, we're just going to give it to other people. Um, you see where the fault is and you see how a colonial entity ended up just prescribing it to another colonial entity or a product, post-colonial entity. Um, so, yeah, it's just very interesting. I think we can move on to the next question. The events of the Nakba resulted in the Zionist entity founded on 78% of the area of historic Palestine. More than 15,000 Palestinians were killed. The Zionist entity controlled 774 cities and villages, or all of the above. I'm not going to lie, I was surprised by that. I thought it was just going to be one of them, but it's mad. So more than 15,000 Palestinians were killed. And we're talking about the, uh, it's, it's it's not really a, a long period of time in which these events occurred. It wasn't years and years and years. The the the, the although although a lot of land was bought um, by the uh, uh, Zionist uh, Zionist movement uh, across the years, the action of of, of murder and um, pillaging and stealing actually happened within a short period of time. So it's actually quite it's quite mad that this this all happened together. Uh, in such a small uh, kind of window. But yeah, let's move on to the next question, please. Okay. Wow. Competition is still high still. This metal key symbolizes the permanent right of the Palestinian refugee. What is this right? Is it the right to self-determination? Is it the right to resettle in another country? Is it the right of return or is it the right to life? Yes, it is the right of return. The key doesn't just symbolize the fact that we have the right to return. The key symbolizes the fact that families, just like my grandmothers, um, just like uh, so many families, they left temporarily. They just, all they did was lock their, their houses with the keys. And a lot of the keys did look like that back in the day. Um, and they would just leave. And so the only possession that they really had was that key in a lot of, in, in a lot of the cases. So it's just, um, it symbolizes more than just the fact that you're returning, but it's, it's, it's the fact that they left with nothing but that. Um, interestingly, um, in Israeli law, in the state of Israel, there is the right of return. However, 
um, they established the right of return, although it's supposed to allow for Palestinians to return, it's only in effect to allow for Jewish um, uh, uh, Jews all around the world um, the right to come to the state of Israel and become a citizen of the state of Israel. And it's uh, further emphasized under the new uh, nation state law that they've uh, uh, established. But yeah, we can move on to the next question. Right, question 18. The number of Jewish immigrants in Palestine between the period of 1917 to 1948 increased from 50,000 to nearly 700,000, they're, they're very big jumps, if we're being honest, like from 30,000 to that, either way. Like, you see, that's quite a jump, it's quite an exponential jump. Um, and that sh if you see that ship, that ship actually um, shows you basically an example uh, of, of arrivals from Europe. Um, but Jews didn't just arrive from Europe. So a lot, so um, uh, the Zionist movement worked very, very, very hard to try and convince uh, the Jewish population in Iraq, uh, the Jewish population in North Africa, uh, although it wasn't as easy, but however, there were tensions um, rising in those areas. So a lot of uh, Jews in those areas did feel more inclined to leave and go to say, uh, and, and go and become a part of the state of Israel. However, uh, the state of Israel, because of um, its colonial entity and the fact that it's established as a colonial state, the racism that it's founded within treated um, the, the, the Jews from North Africa and Jews from Iraq and so on, we call them Mizrahi Jews, as well as the Jews from uh, Ethiopia and Africa, they treated them as second class citizens. And that just shows you the flaw in, in this colonial entity. Anyways, we can move on to the next uh, question. All right, we're seeing the same people just recycling because I think just, yeah, it's, just, it's all about time though. So I'm just making How many days did the war of 1967 go on? There's a very, very famous name for that war. So, you know it, you can get to answer that question very, very easily. Yes, so it's the Six Day War. It literally was a war in six days. Um, it's embarrassing because the the they call it the Nexa at that time. What what if what, so what happened was there was a war between um, some Arab countries and Israel. Um, so this is so 1948. So we're talking, uh, I think, what 19 years after the establishment of the state of Israel. So 19 years after the first catastrophe. This is the Nexa. And in 1967 there was a war, and the Arabs failed miserably. And they didn't fail miserably because they couldn't win. It's because they didn't want to win. Egypt could have won that war very easily, but instead they lost the Sinai Peninsula and it was one of the most embarrassing losses. Jordan could have won, but they decided that's not. Um, and they lost the West Bank. And my grandfather was in uh, was serving uh, 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 as a Jordanian uh, police officer at the time. And the Jordanians told police officers, soldiers to abandon their posts in, in the West Bank. He was in, 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 in Hebron. Um, and let the Israelis through, and that's what happened. Um, and they took it so easily, as if there was really no one there. Um, and that's really one of the most heartbreaking things. Um, and this is where this is when the West Bank and Gaza became under um, uh, Israeli occupation for the first time. Okay, so we're seeing someone else in the lead now. Okay, this is uh, quite interesting. All right, question twenty. Uh, what was the result of Annexa nineteen sixty seven? Kind of giving you hints here, isn't it? Um, was it that the Arab army was 80% of the military capacity? The land of the Zionist entity multiplied three and a half times. All of the above. Almost 21,000 Arabs died. Imagine. Arab armies lost 80% of their military capacity. And the Zionist entity multiplied three and a half times. So you got that there. Yeah, moving on. Okay, seeing a. Uh, Big kind of turn in the tide. Which of these Arab armies participated in the Nexa war, fought a fierce battle in Janine and nearly liberated? Was it the Jordanian army? Was it the Iraqi army? Was it the Egyptian army? And was it the Lebanese? I think it would reach high for that. Rocky on, just saying. Um, 
I don't have much information, so I can't really say any much. But it's very interesting, though. So. Oh, Robert is in the lead. What are you saying, Robert? Alaksa Mosque consists of the of the Rock, which is the gold thing, or the Marwani Mosque, which is the Mosque, Ghibli Mosque, or Al or the above. Wow. So, um, Amr, can you just put on the picture so that I can just explain? So, this is something that the uh, that Israel, the state of Israel, and Zionist entity actually takes advantage of. Because a lot of people think that Al-Aqsa Mosque is just the Dome of the Rock, that golden thing. And by the way, that golden thing was only became gold um, under King Hussein of Jordan, um, who was the king uh, prior to the current one. Um, because he he ruled Jordan, uh, sorry, he ruled the West Bank, um, and it was under uh, Jordanian control until the 1967 war, the Nexa. And so he what he did was is he uh, replaced the uh, its uh, uh, it's uh, it was a grey dome with a a gold dome, um, but just that's the dome of the rock. Okay, if you look just to the south of it where the mouse is, that's Al Qibli Mosque, and a lot of pe other people think that's Al Aqsa Mosque. But well, that's not Al-Aqsa Mosque, that's Al-Masjid Al-Qibli, okay? Al-Qibli Mosque. And um, then there's another uh, mosque, which is called the Marwani Mosque, and it's actually underground. So uh, the Marwani Mosque is massive. It's it's more than twice the size of Al-Qibli Mosque, and it's just it's underground. So if you look at the walls, look where the mouse is going, where the pointer is going, that entire compound is Al-Aqsa Mosque. And so these buildings didn't actually exist back at the time. It was just those grounds that existed, and that's why it was called Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Um, when the Prophet sent, uh, um, uh, did the Isra and Mi'raj and he went and he led the prayers and all of that stuff that happened in Al-Aqsa Mosque, it is thought that uh, it's believed that Al uh, the Al-Aqsa compound was actually built by the angels, similarly to the initial build of Al-Kaaba, that it was built by the angels at the start. Um, but everything else, the, these buildings, you see, they were built later on. So the Dome of the Rock was actually built by uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, um, one, of the, uh, one of the Umayyad uh, rulers. So yeah, okay. Okay, we'll try and go quicker. Sorry, I was just trying to keep it as informative as possible. Um, uh, if you can't stay, then there's no worries, no pressure really. Apologies. Uh, how many minutes does the lots of Moscow? Right, so there's four. Um, four seems to be an average number, really. If you go to different mosques, there generally that that makes sense. Would it make sense to have seventy or thirty, really, or even fifteen? But yeah, we just move on. Uh, Robert, you're on fire, sir. All right, carry on. Um, how big is the Al Aqsa Mosque? Is it an acre? Is it five acres? Five acres. Maybe, maybe. Try and you know use your engineering kind of skill to. Play and see what one. I don't know. So. Right, so 144 acres. That's actually a big, big piece of land. Very, very big piece of land. But yeah. What's happening under the Al-Aqsa Mosque right now is that there is uh, a lot of uh, Zionists and supported by obviously the state of Israel. They're digging under, um, and they're trying to. So what they've done is they've set up like an exhibition. Where that mouse is pointing, that's the Wailing Wall, and there's a section under there that gives access to under the compound. Um, Wailing Wall is a very, very significant uh, area of the compound to uh, uh, members of the Jewish faith, and that's where they go and pray. But just from that uh, section, they go under the compound, um, and what the State of Israel have done is they found art. They 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 claim that they found artifacts, but a lot of them are actually um, uh, the then they weren't actually found under the compound. Um, and they claim that uh, this was the 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 old uh, this was the place of the older. You can remove the image and move on, but this was the place of the Solomon's Temple, and they use that to justify the digging. And what they're doing by digging is they're trying to kind of remove uh, the Qibli Mosque and replace it with the um, Solomon Temple. Questions are tough. But remember, at the end of the day, 
this is a learning process so it's very important and just keep a you know, mental note on it or even very good for um, learning about Palestine. Under the Treaty of Salah Adina, you and Jerusalem would remain in the hands of... Tell me, you know. Let me know. Muslim but Christian pilgrims would be allowed. Okay, so... Um, just to explain, the protection of Jerusalem um, and the protection of the Jewish sorry, the protection of the um, religious entities that weren't just Muslim, the other uh, religious entities that existed in Jerusalem, didn't just start at the time of Salah al-Din. It actually started at the time of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anh, the second caliph, the second uh, Muslim caliph after uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And uh, it was just the fact that when the, when the Muslims lost Jerusalem to the Crusaders, the, Crusade, uh, the, the Crusades and, 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 and the Crusaders, they oppressed and they marginalized uh, the religious groups the oppressed Jewish population, uh, the the Jews that were li living in the region, as well as the Muslims, and so when the return of Salah al-Din came, it wasn't just um, uh, what's it called uh, a transfer of power to the Muslims. Um, it also brought hope to a lot of people there, not just Muslims, but also some Christians and uh, and Jews um, that were living in the area because of the oppression that they lived, uh, they they saw under the um, the uh, Crusades. By the way, guys, don't worry about if you're losing, because there's a lot of questions. So, who built the Dome of the Rock? I said it. So, remember, figure it out. The reason, by the way, it's called the Dome of the Rock, is because if you go inside and go under, there's a rock, and it's supposed to have levitated the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he uh, uh, when he rose upon it, uh, it, ha it has levitated him. So when you go under, it's a rock, and it's supported like as in the rock isn't floating. The rock has what well, there's a space under the rock. It's really weird, but it's built on top of that. Really, the building looks small from the photo, but if you look under, if you go in, actually, it's massive. Like I didn't expect it to be that big when I went. So yeah. Wow, it's a bit. Is that beef, man? Is that beef? What's going on? Uh, I said, Robert, watch your back. Say no. Which is the first tribe to live in Jerusalem? Is it the Sumerians? Is it the Jebusites? Is it the Phoenicians? Or is it the Pharaohs? I wonder. Try and see if any of these names ring a bell. So it's the Jebusites. I'm not going to lie, I don't know much information, but interesting. I hit Wikipedia soon. Huh. All right. The geometric shape of the Dome of Rock. Is it an octagon? Or is it a pentagon? Or is it a heptagon? Or is it an hexagon? I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not trying to violate, but I am. If if you can't clock, you can count on the side, yeah? Maths is not your strong suit. Don't ever do maths. That's have to disappoint me with three and the five people, the eight people that didn't do it right. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So octagon, eight. Yeah, maths. Anyways, carry on. <sighs> I said I read the answers triangle. I don't know why. Was it Peckham? I left on a car too. Or was it Pasta? Yeah, I'm dead still. Philista or Palestina? Philistia or Palestina? Oh, uncle jokes, you know, it's kind of sad. Really sad. But yeah, it was Philistia. Also, that flag, I'm not going to lie, let's just, let's just straighten it out, yeah? That flag, okay, only existed at the time of the British mandate. So it's not, it, it was a product of British uh, colonial rule. However, you know, it is what it is still. And moving on. Roughly what percentage of Palestinian land is dedicated to olive trees? Is it 18%? Is it 45%? Is it 10%? Is it 93 Olive trees fill Palestine. Like literally. And it's a it's a sign of resistance as well, by the way, in, in Palestine. 45% is a huge, huge number. 
Det er det, okay. Right, we can move on. All right, next question. We've only got 20 questions left. We can go through them quickly, inshallah. What is the worldwide Palestinian? Remember, around 700,000 refugees left. But we're talking, that's what? 2021. That's over. Oh, my math is not really working, is it? It's over 70 years ago. So, families get bigger. But more than 10 million. More than 10 million Palestinians outside, right? The right of return and, and stuff like that just considers all of all of all, all of these things. It's a bit mad. It started from 700,000 who left Palestine, and including there's around I think five million Palestinians in in inside Palestine, and on top of that there will be around five million diaspora. The Hejaz train line developed by Sultan Abdul Hamid connected Istanbul to Palestine and. Is it Russia, is it Mecca, or is it Poland, or is it Oman? So interesting point. Um, there is, I don't know if it's, I might be wrong, so if anyone does want to correct me, can correct me, but the the Ottomans didn't carry on with the with the track. Um, to, to Mecca, the train actually led up to Medina, and after um, uh, Abd Sultan Abdul Hamid was overthrown by the Young Turks, uh, the Young Turks uh, was, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, the Young Turks tried to extend the Hijaz railway to Mecca, but the ruler of Mecca, who or the governor of the Hijaz, the Hijaz is the entire region that um, holds uh, Medina and Mecca as well, who is also the ancestor of the current Jordanian king, uh, didn't want that because he thought that if they extend the railway, then the businesses that relied on transporting um, pilg uh, pilgrims from Medina to Mecca on camelback and horseback would be affected by it. And he also thought that it was a way for the uh, young Turks to try and influence his governing ways, and he didn't like it. Now, there is a bit of a uh, kind of uh, difference opinion when it comes to why it happened and who is in the right and whatnot but yeah yeah arab leaders have been such a disappointment they continue to be such a disappointment or else palestine would be free right now but they don't care anyways we can move on uh next point right when sultan abdul hamid the sultan last sultan of the ottoman empire oh sticky one okay uh was asked to have you say yes, you say, uh, you know, I'm just going to think about it. Or do you say, I cannot have uh, the land that doesn't belong to me. Or what's in for me? Uh, what's in it for me? Yes, he, he stood quite a noble um, stance when it came to that. And this is the difference between a colonialist and a conqueror. Um, and, and this is my kind of way of understanding it. So in Islamic rule, you conquer a land, but you don't colonize it. You don't, you don't change the way of people's lives. You don't. Don't enforce something, um, but yeah. Um, so it's quite it's quite an interesting uh, way. Like when you treat someone fairly and you don't uh, colonize them, you end up being just in, in that sense. Which of the following is the title of a poem written by Palestinian? Multi, my homeland. Beiti, my home. Habibti, my darling. Ummi, my mother. Yes, so the majority of you got it right. It's Maltini, and it's that guy in the photo is his name Ahmad Tukan, right? Yeah, so he's a famous Palestinian poet. That poem was, um, what's it called, used as the uh, national anthem of Iraq, by the way. Yes, and you're right. Hey, Muhammad, hey, Muhammad Salim Nasir, what are you saying, man? So, yeah, that's true. The last caliph wasn't actually Abdul Hamid, it was Abdul Majid. Um, uh, I'm excited for um, telling us that and correcting us. <laughs> I said, can you get some? Which country is home to the largest population of Palestinians outside of Palestine? That's Petra. Yeah, the photo is Petra. If you know where Petra is, you know the answer. Okay, more, okay. Say no more. All of you got it right. Allah, that's really good. Jordan, I'm not exaggerating if I say may six. More than 60% of its population are even originally Palestinian, let alone the refugees within. There's a huge uh, refugee. The queen, 
The Queen of Jordan is Palestinian as well, by the way. Queen Rania. Okay, we can move on, by the way, the next question. If you go to Jordan, do visit Petra, though. It's nice. Which of the following famous people are Palestinian? Is it Hamad Asaf? Is it Queen Rania? Or is it Jordan? Yeah. And you know what? It's mad, but the Hadid family, like, as you know, they are, you know, they are in the model life and they are caught up in the whole Beverly Hills and the celebrity life. But one thing that's quite admirable is the fact that although they're in that circle, they never denounced their Palestinian heritage and they never ceased to talk about Palestine and Israel and they always you know, advocate for Palestine as well. So it's very, very, very um, nice to see that because a lot of people do let go of their identities, unfortunately, when they assimilate into Western cultures. So yeah. All right, moving on, next question. Which is the largest Is it Al-Najah National University? Is it Al-Azhar University? Is it Bethlehem University? Or is it Birzeit University? If you can read Arabic, that photo might give you the right answer or it might just mislead you. I'm not involved. Right, so in Arabic it said Al-Najah um, University. The English wasn't really, the English isn't really like easily readable, but Jamaat and Najah al is said in Arabic. Birzit is also a very, very big university in West Bank. It's very, very, very active. It's known for its uh, uh, re kind of the presence of big resistance groups within like among the youth and among um, students there. So yeah, very interesting. Anyways, we can move on to the next one. Al-Azhar, by the way, is in Egypt. Al-Azhar University, yeah? No way, almost ended up there. Say, you bust case, yeah? No. Which of the following writers? Rassan Fakani, Edward Saeed, Mahmoud Darwish, Najib Mahfoud. Najib. Najib was in Najib. Okay, I'm giving you a hint there. Yeah, say no more. Um, Edward Saeed um, is very, very, very famous. Mahmoud Darwish is very, very famous. I'm going to as well. Um, Edward Saeed is known to be kind of like the father when it comes to ideas about Orientalism. And, so on. and I, I do urge. Uh, Right, the oak of Ibrahim alayhi salam, an oak tree in Hebron, was primarily used by the Prophet Ibrahim to sleep, read the Quran, pitch his tent during the travels, or meet his friends. Did he sleep? Did he read the Quran there? Ibrahim, Quran, uh, tent, yeah, or did he link up? So clearly he was pitching his tent. Obviously, the Quran, the book uh, that was that came down as a revelation at the time of Prophet Muhammad, clearly didn't exist at the time of. Uh, Prophet Ibrahim, although the religion of Islam is consistent among all of the prophets. So yeah, pitch is 10. Uh, kind of cool stuff. Anyways, next up. Next uh, question. Prophet Isa alayhi salam was born in born in Yaffa, was he born in Bethlehem? Was he born in Gaza City? Or was he born in Jerusalem? Like, come on. If you don't know this, See the free people, yeah. Like, did you not do nativity at school? Huh? Um, but yeah, it's kind of easy to get mixed up with Jerusalem as well. But Bethlehem is famous and known for the birth location of uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Yeah. So, cool stuff. All right, we can move on to the next one. Next step. Prophet Dawood ruled Palestine for. 25 years, 35 years, 40 years, 50 years. I wonder. All right, 40 years. Interestingly, Prophet Dawood is uh, Prophet Suleiman's son. Dawood is David, King David, um, uh, who ruled the kingdom of Israel. His father is King Solomon, Prophet Suleiman. And yeah, it was a lineage of the sons of Israel, the tribe of sons of Israel who ruled the kingdom of Israel at the time. Very interesting stuff. But yeah, we can carry on now. All right, next question. Not many questions left, so we're almost finished. Which of these prophets had a huge influence on the architecture of Al-Quds? Prophet Dawood, Prophet Musa, Prophet Yahya, or Prophet Zakaria? Nice. 
nice tune, you know. Prophet Dawood, well, kind of makes sense because the Prophet Dawood was the king at the time and he did rule the region. Um, and because he ruled the region, you know, got influence somewhat. Anyways, moving on. You can see I kind of waffled there because I don't have enough uh, information about that. Where did the final Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ascend from the heavens from during the night journey of Isra and Miraj? I kind of mentioned it briefly. Is it Masjid al-Haram? Is it Masjid al-Aqsa? The Masjid al-Nabawi or the Blue Mosque? Right, it is in Masjid al-Aqsa. So yeah, Masjid al-Nabawi is in Medina and Masjid al-Haram is in Mecca. Haram is in Mecca. Masjid al-Aqsa is in Jerusalem and that's where he ascended. The, the ascension happened on that rock in the Dome of the Rock. Carry on, please. Can we go to the next question? I'm liking this event. That's kind of lit. How many times is Christian? Is it once? Is it twice? Is it twice? Or is it more? That's not twice. Yes, because there are different. Um, Churches within Christianity, and so therefore there are different dates to be celebrated. Um, so you have the Orthodox Church, um, you have the Catholic Church. There's a third one. Um, can someone uh, tell me, please? Because I kind of don't know what the third one is, but I know the Orthodox have it somewhere around Gem. Uh, so this is the Eastern. Oh, is the Orthodox Church different to the Eastern Church? I'm not sure, but generally, maybe. Uh, Oh, maybe it's the maybe it is the Maronite. I'm not sure, but yeah, maybe it is the Maronite. But basically, um, uh, I know the Orthodox they have it in, uh, and that's the Eastern Church. They have it in January, on time like. Okay, so Catholic, Armenian, and Orthodox. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for that. So yeah, Catholic, Armenian, and Orthodox. <laughs> Some of the Robert's case, you know. What type of stitch is used in Tatris? The Tatris. Uh, embroidery cross stitch or is it back stitch blanket stitch or leaven stitch come on. it's cross stitch man come on it's very like just x's literally just like that's how you make it um but yeah carry on it's used to sew dresses um cardigans um things you could put on your wall anything really it's pretty cool all right, we've got four questions left. The hallmark red color of the Palestinian embroidery came from the dye produced using native plants, insects, human blood, red pepper. Uh, red pepper. It's an interesting question. I've never come across a question like this. So it'll be interesting for me to learn as much as you guys are learning as well. Let's see. Human blood. And a sticky one still. I don't know where they got the blood from, but maybe from the martyrs and stuff. But that's quite deep if you think about it. That's sad. No, don't at, don't at Robert. That's my guy. Don't at him like that. No, no petitions kick him. No, relax. Handala is for the Palestinian people for justice and self determination. What is Handala? Yes, it is a cartoon image. Um, and it was drawn by a famous cartoonist called Najil Ali and he, Najil Ali was assassinated actually no way, really, my dad worked with him in Kuwait back in the day so nice to meet you, I don't know what your name is because it just says A Najil Ali is your cousin, Allah, very small world man very small world, Allah uh, nice to meet you Aya, yeah, so Najil, so we got, a, we got a relative of um, the cartoonist who is a martyr and an icon uh, of uh, Palestinian resistance so it's a pleasure and an honor to meet his relative. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Right, can we move on to the next question? So uh, Najid Ali was, I think, assassinated. Um, there is a bit of a... Who it is? It's not being good. Uh, that was created to make what more entertaining? Group work, preparing for that rap, making traditional Palestinian clothing, or preparing gold brace, uh, bracelets? Roof work. So I'm guessing, yeah, people were working on the roof and they just decided to bust a couple choo-choo steps. And we got this out of it, so kind of fun, yeah. 
Next time I do some construction, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> point me to track seven. Uh, which artist has a hotel showcase? Like, I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna be in. It's very easy. Yeah. I don't even know who Clive Paxton is. I don't know who Layla Shawa is. Just know about Banksy. All right. Last question. The orange tree motif. This one, I want to give you a hint, but no, I'd rather give it to you as a fact. And we can leave, leave it like that, really. Very interesting fact. I'm not going to give you any hints here. Yes, it's Jaffa or Jaffa. What do we know about Jaffa cakes? What do they have in them? They have oranges. Okay. And what do we know about uh, the, or why is it called Jaffa cakes? It's because they used to ex export oranges from Jaffa. Okay. And take them to, uh, what's it called? Uh, to produce Jaffa cakes. And that's why it's called Jaffa cakes. Oh yeah, very interesting. All right, can we uh, carry on? All right, so let's see who's the, the winners and the runner-ups. Okay, so third place is Hamza Stetan. Robert Andrews is second place. And then we got final place, drum roll, whatever you want to do. Hind, okay, wow. Hind one. Why is there a mistake? Oh, and then we got runner up, Yatina Nirmin. Oh, hurrah. Okay, Atman, well done as well. Uh, so, well done, guys. Congratulations. See, you guys have a lot of knowledge on this. Um, I'm really glad that you guys had fun. I hope you guys had fun. And I hope you guys benefited. And whatever questions you guys have, feel free to ask us. Whether it's here in this session before we end it or on social media, um, feel free to give ASAP a follow. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to having you guys at our other events, inshallah, and keep you updated on everything. Um, the winners will be contacted for the prizes. And yeah, it's lit, man. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I kind of enjoyed that and I learned a lot actually because there was a lot of things that I didn't know as well. And I I honestly urge you guys to read about the, about, about everything. Uh, just give yourself kind of the time to read about the historical uh, background of the of the conflict and whatnot. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, Massa was on it for a long time, you know. So like, mashallah, well done. And yeah, no worries guys, what well, Um, I honestly look forward to doing more interactive events. There's a lot of information, obviously, we didn't touch upon, but we kind of have to leave leave it till um, we have more like uh, educated guests, inshallah. So like knowledgeable uh, lecturers and and, uh, and so on that can uh, lecture us on, on the subject. So yeah, thank you guys. Well done, man. I'm very proud of you all, honestly. Um, I don't know what, what's next, really. What are we supposed to do? I'm, I'm, uh, if you want to like unmute yourself, you can. Just let me know what, what we have to do. I said, Rob, give me money or well, follow ASAP. Bro, do it for the cause, man. Come on. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to end it, yeah? Uh, it, it was a pleasure um, to host you guys. Uh, it's me, Abdurrahman Tamimi. Um, really hope that soon, soon enough, we can actually do these events in person because it'll be so much, like, fun uh, and uh, we'll have much more, like, you know, we'll enjoy it much more. But obviously, until then, please, please, please uh, do stay safe and um, take care of yourselves. Honestly, it's not worth putting yourselves at risk. So, you know, keep it. Stay indoors, man. It's not worth it. Anyway, y'all are safe, guys. Um, and uh, ASAP will contact the winners, inshallah, and that way you can get your things. Yeah. All right. Safe, guys. Me out.